We must have a high view of God's word. It's got the power to deliver the depressed and the oppressed. It's got the power to restore relationships. The power to save souls and save the sinner. It's got the power to defeat the devil. Make one wise. Renew one's mind. Shape one's worldview. And direct one's life. Listen to me. The word of God is all sufficient. Again, it's the ultimate weapon. The ultimate weapon. I titled today's teaching, A Talking Donkey and a Pagan Prophet. At this point in the narrative, Israel is closer to Canaan, closer to Israel, closer than ever before. And Numbers chapter 2 consists of the king of Moab named Balak and a false prophet named Balaam. Sometimes people get confused with these two because the name sounds so alike. King Balak is terrified because of Israel's nearness. Israel is getting closer to Canaan and they're very close to the borders of Moab. They're actually camping in the territory of Moab. And so what he does is he hires a pagan prophet by the name of Balaam. And he wants to give him lots of money to curse Israel. But as we'll soon see, God steps into the picture and causes Balak's wishes to utterly backfire. Let us start here in Numbers chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 to 4. I hope you guys are in the mood of reading this evening because we're going to be doing a lot of that. Numbers 22, 1 to 4. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab, on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. By the way, Jericho will be the first city that they overcome here soon. Verse 2, Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. This was a very large company, as you know. And Moab was sick with Dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. In other words, if they get any closer, we're going to have a major economic crisis. They're going to use up all of our commodities, all of our materials. They're going to eat up all of our food. And breathe up all of our oxygen. We can't have them too close. It says, And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. We read here about Moab and the Moabites. The Moabites were descendants of Lot. Uh, Moab was Lot's firstborn son by his firstborn daughter. You heard me right. This was incest. As Lot's daughter got him drunk in order to lay with him to, quote unquote, preserve his name due to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the point is, Moab or the Moabites are the descendants of Lot, who is the nephew of Abraham. What Moab didn't know was that God wasn't planning on harming Moab at this point. We find there in Deuteronomy 2.9, if you want to turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 2.9. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given R to the descendants of Lot as a possession. And so... They didn't know that promise. They didn't know that word from God, but they were already protected. But again, the king of Moab had no idea, and he was super, super fearful because he thought they were going to come and conquer them just the way they did the Amorites in chapter 21, where Israel comes in, he beats them down, or the nation beats them down and takes their land. And so the king of Moab thought he was next. God's people were getting closer to Canaan and were defeating cities on their, on their way there. But again, the first city that they will 
Defeat in Canaan would be Jericho. King Balak was so afraid that he felt that he had to call for backup. He knew that uh, the army of Israel was too great and too strong. And so what he does is he looks for help by looking to the elders of Midian or the leaders of Midian. By the way, the Midianites were descendants of Abraham through Keturah. We find that in Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 to 4. Let us read Numbers 22, 5 to 6. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. This is the kind of next door neighbor that he does not want. He dreads this next door neighbor. Verse six, therefore, please come at once. Come now, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. He says there, they are too mighty for me. And so we find that King Balak is extremely desperate at this, at this point. He already sees himself defeated. And so again, he teams up with the Midianites, but he also looks for Balaam to hire him to curse Israel. Balaam was a popular sorcerer at that time and in that area. In chapter 24 and verse 1, we find that he practices magic. He was like a, a wizard, a sorcerer, if you will. King Balak knew that physical war won't work. That won't suffice. He felt he needed some spiritual help. He felt he needed a pagan prophet. He needed a sorcerer. He needed to get some demonic help through witchcraft and curses. And so he was doing all that he could to try to defeat Israel. He looks to, he looks to the Midianites and then he looks to Balaam. He says, for I know. He knew something about Balaam. Again, Balaam was popular. Balaam must have been well known for placing curses on people and for those curses to actually work. And that's the reason why he says there, for I know that whom you bless is blessed and whom you curse is cursed. In other words, Balaam was a successful sorcerer. A successful sorcerer. And so he felt that if anyone's going to help me, it's going to be you. I know your work. I know the power that you have. Let us read Numbers 22, verse 7 to 8. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word for you. As the Lord, that is Yahweh, speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Both the leaders of Moab and Midian came to Balaam with the diviner's fee. So there was a set amount of money, a specific cost when it came to hiring pagan prophets or mediums like this here, Balaam. So it shows us that paying pagan prophets to pronounce curses on their enemies was a common practice. This was a diviner's fee. This was a set fee. This was, this was known to everybody. If you're going to hire a well-known sorcerer, you pay him this much. Balaam was no stranger to making big bucks for his wicked, even demonic business. 
Balaam had a connection with Satan. Uh, Balaam had a connection with false gods. In fact, the main false gods of the Moabites was Shemesh. And Balaam really worked for the enemy. And then he goes on to say there, as the Lord speaks to me. Now, when you read that, you think, how is it that a sorcerer is going to be used by God at this point? It may seem a bit confusing that Balaam sought the Lord Yahweh, the one true God, the one true God to get an answer. But sorcerers at this time had no problem calling on false gods. And Balaam knew that the God of Israel was Yahweh, so to Yahweh he went and called upon. And so these sorcerers were willing in one sense to work with any God. False gods, the true God. And so he calls on Yahweh, why? Because he knows that Yahweh is the God of Israel. And so Yahweh answers his call because Yahweh is going to protect his people. He's going to give them an answer. In Numbers, again, 24 and verse 1, it tells us that Balaam seek to use sorcery. He seek to use sorcery even before calling on the Lord Yahweh. And so again, this man was a sorcerer. It may seem like he had a relationship with Yahweh, but he didn't. But he knew that he can call upon him to get an answer regarding Yahweh's people. Let us read Numbers chapter 22, verse 9 to 12. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Of course, God already knows who they are. He knows everyone. He's omniscient, right? But he's just going to have a conversation with them. Verse 10. So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Knowing Balaam, I'm sure he didn't like that answer because he was, of course, waiting for his check. He was waiting for his diviner's fee. This is what he normally did. He blessed people and cursed people, and he made money for it. But you notice there it says, Then God came to Balaam. It was God who came to Balaam. So here we see that God made the first move. I don't think that Balaam had the chance to call on Yahweh like he usually calls on other gods, false gods and evil spirits. God came to Balaam because, again, Yahweh is the king of Israel. And as king, he comes to defend and protect his people from any form of attack, whether it comes by sword, physical warfare, or it comes through sorcery, which is spiritual warfare. And so it was God that came to Balaam and he says, you're not going to curse them. They are blessed. The Lord answers, you shall not curse the people for they are blessed. King Balak and Balaam were the ones on the verge of being cursed by God. Because God tells Abraham, and I'm sure you guys already thought about it. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will what? Curse those who curse you. We find that in Genesis 12 and verse 3a. And so if these men would have gotten their way, God would have come against them immediately. God would have cursed them. And so, they did not know Yahweh. They did not know that coming against God's people would cost them their lives. They didn't know Yahweh. They knew His name. They had some background on the children of Israel, but they didn't know Yahweh's promise to Israel. 
They didn't know God's promise to his people. By the way, this shows us that we as God's children, we as Jesus' disciples cannot be cursed by witchcraft. You never have to fear any sorcerer, any medium, any witch, any warlock, any spouse. You don't have anything to fear. Why? Because you are untouchable. Satan has no power over you. The Bible says that the entire world is under his sway and his control and his power, not the church. So this is a picture of that. No one can cast spells on us because we are blessed by God, meaning that God himself is our impenetrable shield. When I read that, I couldn't help but think of Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 37. So turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 37 to see just how blessed we really are. Romans chapter 8, starting there at verse 31 to 37. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, who can ultimately beat us? 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Verse 26, and as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet... Even though, in one sense, we are a target of the world, we are a target of Satan, 37, yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, right, nor Balaam's and their curses, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you ever doubted how secure you are in Christ, read those passages again. You have been justified. You have been forgiven. Jesus was condemned in your place. We are Extremely blessed. Let us read Numbers chapter 22, verses 13 to 20. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak again sent princes, listen, more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me. For I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. So he's going he's gonna to give him much more than the common diviner's fee. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak, that is the king of Moab, were to give me his house, Full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. At this point, he was literally restrained by God. 
He wanted all those things, but God didn't let it happen because his people will not be cursed. Verse 19. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, that's what he tells him, that's the instruction, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the words which I speak to you, that you shall do. And so we hear, we see here that King Balak doubles down on his efforts. He sends a lot more men, more powerful men, more impressive men, men of stature, I'm sure, of honor, and basically a blank check. And that's the reason why he says, I'll do whatever you say to me. And so he was doing everything he possibly can to impress Balaam because he knew that these mediums loved money. They loved the praise of men. They loved respect. They loved to be honored. And so he says, I'm going to lavish him with honor. I'm going to send my best men. And I'm going to send a blank check too. And so I would have you know that this was a very, very tempting moment for Balaam. I think that Balaam played the part of a true servant of God because instead of holding his ground by saying, Yahweh said no, so it's no, period. Balaam no doubt thought about the offer and said, well, let me double check with God. You're going to give me whatever I want? Don't leave. Let me, let me go talk to Yahweh again. Maybe it changes mind. <laughs> so this whole thing about you can't buy me, that, that was a lie. He was playing the part. He was acting like a godly man, but his motives were evil. They were evil. How do we know? Because, well, as we continue to read... God gets angry with him because, of course, he, his motives were exposed. But 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And so we find there in the New Testament that this man was a lover of money. Right? He was a lover of money. And so, of course, he wanted to take that deal. Of course, he wanted to take that offer. It says he loved the wages of of unrighteousness. In other words, he would curse people for big bucks and smile after. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. However it is he got his money, even through evil and sorcery, he loved the money. He'll do anything for money. The love of money is the root of all evil. We see that here. Let us read Numbers chapter 22, verses 22 to 41. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. Now you and I might say, wait a minute, but he told him to go. But just to make sure that he only says what God tells him to say. Yeah, that's true, but remember the instruction. He says, he says there, if the men come to call you, in verse 20, the men that stayed there didn't get up and call him again. And so what happened was, again, Balaam was after that money. He didn't follow the Lord's instructions. And he got up and he went. What does that tell you? Those dollar signs were in front of him and he was chasing them. His heart was being pulled by the lust for money. It says that the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. By the way, whenever you read the angel of the Lord, that angel of the Lord is believed to be a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Christ, if you will. And then it says, and he was riding on his donkey 
and his two servants with him. That reminds me of uh, Saul on the road to Damascus, right? Saul was on his way to curse God's people. God showed up. He told him, why are you kicking against the goads? In other words, why are you kicking against a sharp object? You're going to hurt yourself coming against me. And then he says here in verse 23, Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And so at this point, imagine that moment, the donkey can now see the spiritual realm and he sees the angel of the Lord with the sword in his hand drawn in this way, ready to slice and dice this man. God was in a warrior's position. And then it goes on to say here, so we see the donkey, he gets out of the way, he turns to the side. So Balak struck the donkey to turn her back onto the rose, a female donkey. 25, then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. In other words, he traps them again. God is not going to stop until he stops Balaam and warns him. Verse 25, And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall, of course, frightened, and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. When it says he struck her, it really does mean that he hit this donkey extremely hard. 26, then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. Now they were completely trapped. There was nowhere, there was nowhere to go. Balaam was standing before the God who was ready to kill him. And he didn't even know it. And it's like that for many who are under the wrath of God. They're on their way to judgment and don't even know it. 27. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So she crouches. She just gets on the ground. Can't go to the left. I can't go to the right. I'm just going to kind of just bow, kind of duck. Lay down. Stop moving. I can just imagine how close that sword was to both of them. She didn't want to go any further, front. So Balaam's anger was aroused. We find there in verse 22 that God's anger was aroused. Now Balaam's anger was aroused. God was angry at Balaam, and Balaam was angry at the donkey. And he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. <laughs> and she said to Balaam, she spoke, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Imagine if our pets could speak. <laughs> 29. And Balaam said to the donkey, That's Funny, because, you know, he should be amazed. <laughs> I'm sure he's never had a conversation with an animal before. And Balaam said to the donkey, he was so angry, he was just ready to talk back to this donkey, not just strike it, but strike the donkey with his words, too. He says, because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. Doesn't somebody there have a sword in his hand ready to kill Balaam? Mm -hmm. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey 
Am I not your pet, your beloved pet? On which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? He's getting rebuked by his donkey. This guy never treated you bad. Never. I can just imagine the donkey. Name the time I was mean to you. Just once, you know. And Balaam says, no. It's terrible. 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. He opened the donkey's eyes first. Now he's, he opened Balaam's eyes. And by the way, no one knows that they're on their way to judgment until God opens their eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. Good move, Balaam. 32. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? First the donkey asked him that question, and now God does. Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. He's exposing him. He's telling him, look, your motives are perverse. You left when I told you not to, and... Well, he basically, he left and he was told to, but he wasn't respecting God's clear instruction. 33, the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. Listen to this. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. At that moment, Balaam should have looked at his donkey, kissed her in the lips, and said, Thank you for saving my life. The donkey had more sense than this pagan, greedy prophet. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I have sinned. I, I didn't obey your instructions. I have sinned. He says, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. In other words, I, I thought you wanted me to go. But he knew that he didn't obey the Lord completely. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. I don't want to go. For, I don't want to go forward. With this, I don't want to go on with this. I'm willing just to wrap this up and go back home. 35. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men. I'm sure that must have been confusing. Go, don't go, go. Okay. <laughs> go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. I'm sure at this time he's thinking, I'm not going to make any money. <laughs> so Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab. At that point, I'm sure he was very relieved. He couldn't wait to see Balaam, his partner in crime, which is on the border at the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send to you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? He said, well, what, what's, what was holding you back? Why were you taking so long? He's like, I know you love money. What took you so long? I'm going to honor you. Are you doubting me? Are you doubting my blank check? 38. And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. I made it. I came. Now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. 
He's saying, look, I don't got power over my words right now. I can only speak what God tells me to speak. And if not, he might taste that sword early. 39. So Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kerjath, Herzoth. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal. That's a false god. Also means Lord, but definitely not our Lord. That from there he might observe the extent of the people. In other words, he positioned them, him in a very high place. Uh, the place where one of their main gods is worshipped. And he wanted to get him to a place where he can see Israel. He can see the crowds. He can see further away. Kind of get a good aerial view of the thing. And so, as we continue to read, we're going to see that Balaam prophesies over Israel four times. I'm going to go ahead and just read a few passages that mention Balaam in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then we'll close. You guys want to do that? Yeah. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 23 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 5 says, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee. Why? Because the Lord thy God loves you. This is a picture of Christ. The Bible says the man who hangs on the tree is cursed. Jesus was cursed in order to bless you with salvation. He says here, God turned the curse into a blessing. You were cursed. He turned it into a blessing by crucifying his son in your place. The curse becomes a blessing for those who are saved and are in Christ. What a wonderful thing. And then he says, because the Lord God loves you. Why did God do it? For God so loved the world. What was the purpose in God turning your curse into a blessing? Turning your hell into heaven? His love for you. Joshua 13 and verse 22. Joshua 13 and verse 22. The children of Israel also killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, among those who were killed by them. What was the end of Balaam's life? A sword through his body. Israel ended up killing this pagan prophet. Why? Because all he was doing was hurting God's people. And it says there plainly that he was a soothsayer. He practiced witchcraft. Let us read Joshua 24 and verse 10. He says, But I would not hearken unto Balaam, Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. He delivered them out of the curse that Balaam was planning on putting on them. God blessed the people even though Balaam and Balak wanted them cursed. And that's the way it is with us. The world may look down upon us. The world may hate us. The world may persecute us. The world may speak evil of us, slander us, poke fun at us. But in the end, all of those words do nothing to the believer because the believer is blessed by God. The words come at us like arrows, but they don't stick. They don't stick. 
Nehemiah 13 and verse 2. Nehemiah 13 and verse 2. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, speaking of King Balak and the Midianites, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them, howbeit our God turned again the curse into a blessing. And Nehemiah is basically saying they, they should have. They should have met them with uh, love and care and consideration. They should have given them bread and water. Not hire a pagan prophet to curse them. Micah 6, 5. O my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted. And so this was repeated so that way they would remember and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Now it says that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. That refers to God keeps his word. That's the righteousness of the Lord. Why did God not allow Balaam to curse God's people? Because God already blessed God's people and he can't go back on his word. And so in stopping Balaam from cursing God's people, it proves that God is righteous. In other words, he always does what's right, he always keeps his word, and he does not lie. Let us read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Peter here is speaking of false prophets and false Christians. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Following the way of who? Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. He restrained the madness of the prophet. Let us read there Jude one eleven. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. And so we can say that Balaam was one of the original prosperity preachers. If they would have had a TBN at that time, he would have had the best slot, or Daystar, or It's Supernatural. There are a few men, as you know, that are just like Balaam in our time. I'll name a few, but we would be here till tomorrow if I named everyone. Kenneth Copeland, Lies for Money, Creflo Dollar, it's in his name, <clears throat> yeah. Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, Joe Olstein, T.D. Jakes, Cash Luna, it's in his name too, Guillermo Maldonado, and many, many, many others are modern-day Balaams. They're paid by the people, like um, Balak wanted to pay Balaam. They're paid by the people to speak whatever the people want to hear. Just like Balak wanted to pay Balaam to speak whatever Balak wanted to hear. But a true preacher of God's word, you can't buy him because he belongs to God. And there's no dollar sign big enough for a true preacher to trade in truth for a lie. That's a reality. Last verse, Revelation 2, 14.
This is regarding the compromising church in Pergamos. He says, but I have a few things against you because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. That's the teaching, the teaching of Balaam. Listen, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornications. And so Balaam still worked for Balak after these prophecies that were forced upon him by Yahweh. After he was done working for Yahweh for a moment and forcefully, he taught Balak how to deceive God's people and cause them to worship their false gods, to sacrifice unto idols, and to take the Moabite women as their sex toys. And we'll find that three chapters from now. And so Balaam was a wicked, wicked man. And this even happens in the church where many false preachers exalt hyper grace. You do whatever you want, you're forgiven. Sleep around, drug up, dope up, live however you want. There's sufficient grace for you. Those are the words of a devil. Men who love people will tell them, in your imperfections, honor the Lord with your whole life, for he purchased you with his blood. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the examples of the Old Testament. This helps us not to be easily deceived by men who profess to know you. I mean, Balaam knew your name and even called you his God. But he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was a lover of money. He was a sorcerer. And he was killed for it. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from any false teaching. I pray that we would be disciples who are faithful to the study of your word, faithful to prayer, that we would not be duped by others who profess to know you and love you and really don't. We love you and we praise you, Lord, for your word. There's nothing like it. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed.